This morning we talked about the angels that have been uh, changed in everlasting change of darkness. And so we left off with the question, what in the world did these angels do? That's what we're going to deal with tonight. So take your Bible and turn to G Genesis chapter 6. That's where we're going to begin tonight. Genesis chapter number 6. And uh, let's have a word of prayer real quick. Father, thank you again for the evening. Bless our time in your word tonight. Thank you so much, Lord, that we can meet freely tonight. Thank you that we're not being pressured or coerced by the government. We pray for Jack Treber and their church tonight in California. God, we pray that you'll turn that situation around. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 6, verse 1. And it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowl of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now notice in verse number one there, the phrase, sons of God. In verse 2, it's from the word B'nai Elohim. That phrase, sons of God, comes from the phrase B'nai Elohim. In the, in the Old Testament, that phrase always, always, always refers to angels. Always. From the book of Job, we find that angels present themselves before the Lord and they rejoice. Job 1.6 says, Now there was a day when the, here it is, sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Same Hebrew words there. And Satan came also among them. You know, it's interesting to note that in the Septuagint, that is the Greek Old Testament, it reads angels of God. And that's a correct translation. Sons of God were angelic beings. They were not people. So these creatures of heaven were being contrasted with women in this passage in Jude. Women are the daughters of men. These fallen angels or demons came to earth and they bred with human women, producing a mongrel race of unusual power and wickedness. These angels, they went out of bounds. We talked about that this morning. They went out of bounds with God, leaving the spirit realm to enter the human realm. They went after strange flesh. Why was it strange? Because they were spiritual beings, not human beings. Now we know that when what these fallen angels did was sexual in nature because Jude verse 7 confirms that. The behavior of these sons of God, or fallen angels, were compared to the wickedness of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, who also went after strange flesh. Uh, Jude 7 says this, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, we're going to speak more of this in another message. So the fallen angels, the Bible says, took themselves wives. That's what Genesis 6 says. Now, the word took there in Genesis 6 is from the word lakak. In the book of Genesis, this word 
describes marriage transactions or taking the taking of a wife. Genesis 4.19, and, and Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of one was Adam, and the name of the other Zilhah. Genesis 11.29, and Abram and Nahor took them wives. So this same word is used in those verses there. Marriage, as well as the human race, were under siege because of these demonic, fallen angels. The offspring from these fallen angels corrupted the human race, as we'll see in a moment. This was a mastermind attempt by Satan to corrupt the human race and make the birth of the Messiah an impossibility many years later. God, however, ruined Satan's plan with the flood. That's how he ruined Satan's scheme. The question that usually surfaced now at this point in the message is this. How can fallen angels who are spirit beings marry women and breed with them? The Bible does say in Matthew 22 verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God. Now notice the next, next two words. The angels of God in marriage. Heaven. The key to that verse is those last two words, in heaven. These fallen angels left heaven's domain to breed with women. Now, how did they do that? We do know from Genesis chapter 18, verse 1 through 8, and Genesis 19, 13, that angels can take human form. We find from those passages, angels can eat. Angels can drink. So the question is, could they have sexual abilities too? I don't know that for sure. I'm not sure. Another answer to the, the question is it, is, it is possible that these demonic spirits actually possessed the bodies of men. Men became demon-possessed. Demon possession was a big problem in the time of Jesus and the apostles as well as today. Somehow, the offspring of these fallen angels who perhaps possessed men and also women, they developed people who grew to extreme strength and size. Now, I cannot explain it all because uh, I, 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 it's beyond me, okay? All I know is here's what I'm reading. And the best I can do is explain here's what I found out. I can't explain it all, but these demons were somehow able to, to control the pituitary gland, which is the growth gland in a person. They were also able to control the adrenal glands, which produces great strength in your body. That strength is seen in the New Testament of men who were demon-possessed. The Bible says in Mark 5, verse 2, when he was coming out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So a man who is demon-possessed meets Jesus, who had his dwelling among the tombs. That's where his home was, among the tombs. And no man, the Bible says, no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him. And the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. So the Bible makes it very clear that those who are demon-possessed have supernatural strength. Genesis 6, 4 states that the children born of these demon-possessed men became gigantic, mighty men. Genesis 6, 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. Also after that, where the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now, let's take a look at that word giants there. The word giants there is from, is from the word nafal, which means to fall, to be cast down. Those of great power that overthrow or crush people. That's what it means. Powerful, wicked warriors came from these unions between these fallen angels and women. 
these giants were called Nephilim, which means fallen ones. That's what it means. The wicked influence and corruption of the human race from these fallen angels or demon-possessed men with women became so bad that God's only recourse was to destroy the earth with the Genesis flood. That's how serious the matter became. Every person on this planet drowned except for Noah and his family who took refuge in the ark. That was the purpose of the Genesis flood. Genesis 6, 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6, 11. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Stop. We're watching it happening right before our eyes in our own country. The influence of Satan on our nation is being shown in the streets now as violence has become out of control. In fact, if you've ever watched some of these people beating up other people, beating up old men, when they show the faces on the, on the tele, with the television camera, they almost look demon-possessed. And I dare say that perhaps some of them may be. Demon, uh, Satanism is very prevalent on the West Coast. In fact, there's a church, a Satan church in downtown San Francisco. I haven't gone there for services, but I've seen there. I've driven by the church and stuff. It's huge. It's massive. Satan worship is very prevalent in our country. But one of the key influences of, of Satan is extreme violence. The Bible says in Genesis 6, 12, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth, here it is, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now because these fallen angels crossed the line, because of their vileness, because of their going after strange flesh, human flesh, these demonic spirits were reserved in everlasting chains of darkness unto the judgment of the great day. In fact, that word reserved is from the word tereo, which means to guard, to keep, to attend to carefully. So these demons that crossed the line had sexual relations with women, God has a very close guard on them right now. They're still under guard. These fallen angels are so dangerous and so destructive, they are guarded and bound in everlasting chains, bonds, or fetters. The place where they are bound is a place of darkness. How many of you are scared of the dark? Raise your hand. Anybody scared of the dark here? I don't like being in the dark either, okay? I'm not terrified, but I don't like being in the dark. I like my flashlight. Amen. Okay? It is the blackness and the gloom of the netherworld where they are bound. These fallen angels got what they wanted, but guess what? They lost what they had. They paid a high price for their rebellion. No longer would they witness the worship and wonder of God Almighty, they would be locked away from His presence. That's going to happen to those who die and go to hell one day. They will no longer be in the presence of God. No longer would they hear the harps and happiness of heaven as angels sang and praised the holiness and the majesty of the Lord. No longer would their eyes behold the glistening glory and grandeur of God and His throne. Instead, they would be confined to the thick darkness of the deep dungeons of the abyss. Now, the abyss is a terrible place because the demons of hell that are not there do not want to go there. We talked, Charles Carl and I talked about this after church tonight or this morning. Evidently, it seems that other fallen angels have been confined in this place 
since the flood in Genesis 6. We know this when a demon-possessed man confronted Jesus. Demons are... The demons, they still fear being sent to this place that other demons are there where they're under everlasting chains of darkness. They are scared to death of this place. Luke 8, 28. Here, here's what it says. Here's a man who's demon-possessed. When he saw Jesus, he cried out. Remember, he's demon-possessed. And fell down before him, and with a loud voice, he wanted to get Jesus' attention. What have I do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? Demons are acknowledging that Christ is the Son of God. It's too bad men can't do that. He says, I beseech thee. All right, he's begging Jesus. I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him. And he was kept bound with chains and fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? He wants to know the name of the demon. And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. So that's what happened in Luke chapter 8. Uh, now, is demon possession real? Oh my, you better believe it's real. Should Christians fool around with? You stay as far away from it as you can. If you've got a Ouija board, blow it up with a nuclear bomb. You should not have, you don't mess with that stuff. Don't go to palm readers, don't, don't mess with Satanism, don't do any of that, you'll get in trouble. You'll, you're going you're gonna to open yourself to a lot of problems, especially with Ouija boards. Those are satanic, you don't mess with them. Uh, Peter also spoke about this place where these fallen angels are confined. 2 Peter 2.4, for, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now, in the New Testament, there are three words for hell. Number one, there is Gehenna. This was a place of continual fire. It refers to the lake of fire, which is the final abode of of those who are condemned for eternity. Now, the lake of fire exists right now. But a lot of people don't realize this. There's nobody in the lake of fire right now. There's nobody there. The first ones that are going to be introduced to the lake of fire are the Antichrist and the false prophet from Revelation 19, verse 20. That's how I know that. Satan, fallen angels, and all the unsaved will be condemned to this place at the end of the millennium and at the great white throne judgment, which is a judgment for unbelievers. There's a second word for hell, Hades or Sheol. It is the temporary place of confinement for the unsaved until they are judged at the great white throne judgment. It is a place of fire. It is a place of torment. We learn that from Luke chapter 16. All those who are in Hades right now, after they have stand, stood before the great white throne judgment, they will be cast into the lake of fire. Then there's a third word for hell, Tartarus. This is the word used in 2 Peter 2.4. For if God spare not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Tartarus was not a Hebrew conception, it was a Greek conception. In Greek mythology, it was considered the lowest hell. It was far beneath Hades and was described as a murky abyss or gloomy dungeon. Fallen angels that are in this place right now, in Tartarus, they will have no trial. Their doom is already sealed. Their confinement or chains are everlasting. The phrase chains of darkness used by Peter uh, was actually a different word used by Jude. The word chains is from the word sirah, which means a chain, a line, or rope. Now, other Greek manuscripts have a similar word that is just slightly different they have the word siros. This word means a pit or underground granary. It forms our English word silo. 
Now, a silo was a tower where grain was stored. Being in Illinois, you should know what a silo is with all our farmers all over the place. Later, it meant this. The word silo meant a pit in which a wolf or other wild animal was trapped. In Tartarus, just like wild wolves, the fallen angels that crossed the line and bred with women are confined in this pit or abyss. They will never get out. Now let me take you back to Genesis 6 and bring out another interesting point about these giants. Look at verse 4, Genesis 6, 4. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in, into the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now, notice the phrase, in those days. This is a reference to the days of Noah before the Genesis flood. Now, notice the phrase, and also after that. This phrase refers to the events that took place after the Genesis flood. Everyone but Noah and his family were killed in the flood. But after the flood, there was a second eruption of more fallen angels or demons that bred with women. It was much smaller in number and it was limited to a small area. These demons were also confined to Tartarus. After the flood, the main area of settlement seems to be in the region of Canaan. For this reason, God ordered the Canaanites to be utterly destroyed, cut off, wiped out, or driven out. This is how they were re removed. Under no circumstances were God's people to interbury with the Canaanites. Now, <clears throat> there were giants in this region. These gigantic people in Canaan were known by several names. They were known as Anakims from, who came from Anak, Numbers 13, 22. These folks were great. They were mighty. They were tall. Then there was the Rephium from Rapha, the Emim, Horim, and Zamzumim. The sight of the giants in Canaan, it terrified those ten spies except for Joshua and Caleb. Jewish literature stated that they were known to be cannibalistic and guilty of every kind of lust, sexual perversion, and violent crimes that were Im uh, just Im unimaginable. Now, Goliath who, uh, Goliath, who David fought, he was from Gath, which is in this region. He was a giant. Goliath was just under 10 feet tall. The NBA would love Goliath today, okay? <clears throat> he was just under 10 feet tall. The demonic influence in Goliath's life was clearly revealed in his confrontation with David and his blaspheme toward the God of heaven. Gath was the old Philistine region that was rampant with idolatry. Now, there were giants also that built the great city of Bashan in the Holy Land. It is believed that these giants were utilized by the nation of Egypt in the construction of buildings and pyramids. That's very possible. It offers a possible explanation of how those huge stones were moved. Now, by giving these examples to us in Jude 5 and Jude 6... God wanted to remind us of several important truths about what happened in history. Number one, no matter what your position may be, sin must be judged. Doesn't make any difference who you are, there are consequences to sin. Number two, no one who rebels against God will escape his judgment. False teachers will be judged. That is what Jude is trying to get across to us. Number three, if God in his justice punished angels, surely he would not hesitate to punish people either who reject Jesus Christ as their Savior. Number four, 
those who introduce heresy into the church, they will be dealt with by the Lord. I tell you what, these preachers across America today that are fooling around and preaching all kinds of junk and deception and trash to people, I'll tell you what, they're going to have to answer to the Lord. Here's the next one. The most heinous sin brings the most grievous judgment. Next one. Those who reject Jesus Christ will have more severe judgment than those who have never heard the gospel. Next you may be wealthy, you may be popular, a great athlete, a smart student, a good neighbor, a professor, a business executive, a teenager, a parent, a grandparent, a well-known politician, or a charitable giver. But unless you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you will spend eternity in a lake of fire forever and never get out. May we heed the lessons of these two verses tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, all the truths that you give us that help us to understand things that have happened in the, in the past. Now, Lord, I don't under, understand everything about what took place between these fallen angels, these demons and women, and how it all came about. I'm just guessing. But it seems like we're on the right track. But Father, we prayed that we would learn the lessons that Jude was trying to get across to us. Lord, we pray that you'll help us to walk close to you each day. Help us not to waste our lives. Help us to be aware of deception. And Lord, protect us from evil, from satanic attacks. Protect our church. Father, we again pray for uh, Brother Treber and his church tonight. Dr. MacArthur, who's going there through the fire. God, we pray that you'll intervene, intervene, and turn that situation around. Bless the invitation tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Let's stand together tonight. <clears throat> Take your song book. Turn to 593. Where he leads me, I will follow. Listen, if you need to pray about a matter tonight, or maybe you just want to pray for our nation, or you feel free to come. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, we invite you to come during the song and sit down on the front row. We'll be glad to show you out the Bible how to be saved. You do what the Lord tells you to do as we sing, page 593. <clears throat> I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Father, we pray that you'll continue to bless our people, meet their needs, protect them from danger, and Lord, keep them healthy, protect them from this virus. 
Lord, bring us back again tonight, uh, Wednesday night as we get into your word again. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Have a good week.